Hello and uh, welcome to my paper. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, hear me talk about it. Uh, and I'd love to hear any questions either in the session afterwards or my contact details are on the screen. Uh, if you have any questions or queries at any stage, please uh, reach out. Um, I do very much enjoy talking about uh, these uh, topics. The paper itself is uh, an overview of a proposed model that can help support the takedown of botnets. The paper is written using IoT botnets as an example. Um, as such, it's optimized for IoT, but the principles themselves will work with any form of botnet. Um, and just really before we get into it, some housekeeping, the conference paper itself will be available on the botnet, on the botconf uh, website. Uh, it's also available on my own website. The, the kind of link is on the screen. And the detailed model which this paper is based on uh, is from an earlier paper of mine. And the link to that is also on the screen as well. Before we get into the details of the proposed model, I think it's worthwhile going through some of the challenges that are present when trying to take down botnets from a legal perspective. The first is a bit of a legal theory one, um, and it's basically that a compromised device, an IoT device, um, it's both, or it's, its owner or operator is both a victim, because a botnet operator has come in and uh, added malware to that, but it can also be viewed as a perpetrator because this device is in itself causing damage. Um, and this creates a bit of a problem in the law. Um, the kind of, kind of actually kind of legal approaches work really well when it's very clearly defined roles. When there's a blurring or an overlap, we get a suboptimal outcome. Um, and the consequence of this in terms of botnets has been we really ignore the nodes and the devices and we focus on the botnet in the whole. This is reinforced by the scale problem where the individual damage caused by a given device is effectively in, 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 infinitesimal. Um, and therefore, again, we focus on the botnet as a single entity on the whole and we target the botnet operator. This leads to some problems which we go into in more detail and which like my model uh, doesn't actually take this approach. The biggest problem though, um, when it comes to a law enforcement uh, approach or legal approach to, to botnet take stands is what I call persistence. And persistence relates to the fact that a botnet operator has found a way to plant malware for a particular device or a particular class of device. And if that operator is subsequently prosecuted, arrested, his servers taken down, that, that malware uh, still exists on those devices which have been compromised and that method of approach that the botnet operator used uh, is often still in existence which means we go through this expensive exercise of prosecuting uh, individuals of taking down command and control um, infrastructure and servers and we leave the actual threat uh, and the exploit and this is is a problem which exists at all scales of botnet takes down, of botnet takes takedowns which I'll be going through and this is really what my model is built around to fix is how do we solve the problem of persistence when looking at takedowns there's a bit of a hierarchy uh, I'll try and fly through this at the very top we've public international law this is how states interact with each with each other and there is a, a well understood uh, the Corfu Channel case goes back to the 1940s case of if a nation state uh, knows that either entities under its control or entities under that it's aware of um, are engaging in acts which are contrary to the rights of other states they have an obligation to stop this theoretically this would solve the problem of botnets in one country or a botnet operator in one country attacking um, uh, uh, victims in other countries but in reality it doesn't we find it very difficult to uh, uh, establish attack attribution. And even when we know for certain that a particular uh, um, uh, body of a nation state is engaged in this activity, how do we enforce it? Um, that's the problem. So at the, at the public international law level, um, the theory is there, the practice really isn't. We go then a bit lower to the criminal law um, and this 
up front has worked well. There have been very uh, uh, well noted examples of law enforcement agencies taking down botnets and arresting botnet perpetrators and taking down the infrastructure behind it. There is the problem of persistence, which we've already mentioned, but take, for example, a botnet, which I think the kind of Mary Posa botnet, which I go into in a bit um, in, in a few slides time, is a good example. The perpetrator was in Spain. The Spanish authorities were able to uh, target him, arrest him. They were able to work with Spanish ISPs to take it down. And then they were also able to work with the FBI and work with other Eastern European states. But they, they, they actually were really operating in their own area. And as such, there, were, there, there weren't barriers where they had to seek extradition, they had to get local law e enforcement support, and they had to get the backing, really, of the state. It would not be possible today to uh, go after a botnet operator, for example, in Russia, uh, who has the backing of the Russian state. They simply will not turn him over or engage in the investigation, which is a problem in certain regions. Uh, less of a problem where it's essentially allies working together. A level t to the side of this is really working groups. And here we see private and state entities. Uh, we see software manufacturers, ISPs, law enforcement agencies working together. Two examples that I mentioned, one is Conficker, uh, the Conficker working group, um, you know, kind of, kind of really are the textbook case of how to do this. The problem being is it's complicated, it's expensive, it requires a lot of coordination and therefore will only really be applicable when the threat or scope of damage is very, very large. For smaller botnets, it's just not going to be possible to marshal these resources. There are some legal hurdles as well in terms of are the cybersecurity researchers able to actually investigate and attack the actual botnet themselves to get information on it. Um, but really it comes down to this works for large scale threats and again when the countries are working with each other and less so if, if, if like they aren't. Private entities do this. Microsoft is in the news very recently with the TrickBot botnet. They've done it in the past with Neckers and this is really where they or an entity working, say the Microsoft working with ISPs or working with some other researchers uh, put together uh, evidence of a botnet, they are able to then mount uh, a kind of legal approach where usually targeting the botnet command and control infrastructure it needs to be taken down. Problem again is it's expensive, it's complicated, it's time consuming. Um, it's also not very effective because if, if we look at TrickBot, um, there's still a large number of ISPs who just are going to ignore the uh, kind of legal writ from the district court in the States. It will only work in areas where the um, applicability of the court is respected and won't really work outside of that scope. And then at, the, uh, at a level beneath that, we have cyber vigilantes. These are private individuals. They can work alone. They can work in conjunction with... with, uh, with, with um, with other uh, individuals, and I have two examples, one negative, one positive, uh, BrickerBot. Um, this was a La vigilante who created malware, uh, which identified IoT devices, which were vulnerable to Mirai, and brick them um, to stop them forming part of the, the uh, botnet. The problem here is this is essentially the same act as what the uh, cyber criminals who are running Mirai were doing themselves. I mean, this is a crime. Um, and then on the WannaCry, we have Marcus Hutchins. He was able to stop the spread of uh, WannaCry through the registration of the like, domain. The problem here, in Marcus's example, it was effective. It stopped the spread. But overall, is it that effective? Is it? preventing further botnets from spreading? Is it solving the problem of, kind of, per, of persistence? Are the actions themselves actually legal? Uh, and in many cases they aren't, and generally they're not uh, raising the standard that they, they aren't protecting other devices, and therefore they're not really solving th the problem as a whole. They might stop a particular strain of malware or stop the spread of a particular botnet for a short time, but they're not uh, closing the door. Um, this should be, it should be clear now that overall there is no one size fits all 
possible kind of solution, there's a lot of complicated problems which aren't that easy to solve, which is why we are where we are. Um, and really, the model I'm proposing um, is it it's focused on the problem of kind of of kind of persistence, and it recognizes the fact that most jurisdictions who are causing the problems aren't going to play well uh, with law enforcement agencies in in um, in other uh, regions, and it accepts this, and it doesn't require that these problems be solved, which a normal uh, law enforcement approach actually does. The positives, I guess, from the hierarchy is that there is, it is clear that there is an excellent uh, link between researchers and individuals and companies. There's a large amount of information being exchanged. There's a lot of back and forth talking on a formal um, an informal basis, and this is something which which like which needs to form part of the solution and is built into the approach which we'll be going through um, on the next slide. The first point really to get across is this is not a criminal approach. We are not looking to arrest someone. We won't be sending the FBI in to kick down some doors uh, to uh, shut down a botnet. In fact, we won't even be going after the servers that are running these botnets. We've already um, gone through the fact that there are approaches which, which, which target these and they should still uh, continue to happen and, that, and uh, those law enforcement approaches should still keep going, but this approach works on a different basis. It's civil uh, based, so there's no criminal requirement. It's brought by private actors. And as a result of this, there is no centralized uh, entity needed to run the model. We don't need a working group. We don't need someone to take point on this. It's simply going to happen where damage and, and crime occurs. It's efficient as well. And like what I mean by this is it's built around the fact that there is coordination between actors. And uh, it's also taking a look at the fact that a botnet is not a singular entity it is many many nodes and it's built around that fact that it is a network and we target therefore the kind of network itself from a legal perspective it's well understood this is not a novel legal approach this is this this type of approach has been in use for over 100 years it's well understood there is volumes and volumes of case law and there's volumes and volumes of evidence that this actually works and does alter behavior and finally, as I said earlier, the aim here is to target the actual underlying malware, which is causing the spread of the botnet, to create a situation where if a botnet operator is able to get a device into their network, they can't rely on that for a long period of time. And if the botnet operator is taken down in a law enforcement operation, the devices themselves should be cleaned. We change the focus in how we look at botnets. As I said earlier, um, the law enforcement approach has been it's a singular entity that's managed by a botnet controller. Instead, we looked at the botnet B is simply the sum of the individual devices M. And I put in a, a scale factor here, rho, which is how efficient and effective each individual uh, node is at carrying out the aims of the botnet. If it's a DDoS uh, type botnet, I expect row to be very high. If it's more specialist, it's going to need more specialized nodes. And if it's not if it's not able to get them, but instead gets other devices, row will be low, which lowers the efficacy of the botnet, which is important later on. However, this assumes that a botnet is simply a random collection of um, of compromised uh, kind of devices. And that simply isn't true. When a botnet operator is able to crack or, or, or find a way into a particular um, type of device, you're going to see more of those and groupings of these compromised uh, nodes in the botnet. And therefore, we think of botnets instead of groups, which here is there's T groups in the botnet, and it's simply the sum of those groups, each of which has their own nodes. And for, for simplicity, I assume a standardized row per um, group. Uh, just to make the model work uh, on a more simpler basis. But you can see now we've gone from the botnet being a singular entity to a group of, or to a range of individual devices, and we recognize that 
within these range, you've got clumps and large numbers of similar devices. If we are able to fix uh, one group through a single action of, say, the actual building of a patch, um, it knocks all of those devices, in theory, out of the botnet. And therefore, it puts a pressure on the botnet operator to keep finding new devices to uh, to actually like go into it, which won't stay there for long. And once we crack the botnet and take down the operator, if it, if we then target those T groups, um, that's how we can solve the problem of persistence. Um, I should have probably skipped a slide here, but this is. This is basically what I was saying, um, and it's really built around, we need to alter the environment. So an IoT device and the manufacturers of an IoT device, when a vulnerability becomes clear and it becomes known, uh, a patch is, is like released, is pushed out, and it prevents either a person who's taken over the botnet in the event that it's been taken down from, from resurrecting it again, um, or it'll also prevent other devices which have yet to be compromised from uh, falling victim to it. A key point before we go into the model in detail is I mentioned earlier in the law enforcement approach we have an we, there's an effectiveness problem if certain jurisdictions choose not to engage in the process. This is not a problem in this model as long as one or two large markets, such as the North American market or the European market, um, if they buy into this approach, the manufacturers of IoT devices who are selling in that region are going to need to uh, follow the actual principles here. They're not going to hold these patches back from other markets. They're not going to create a uh, a, a series of, of uh, channels and so, so, so like some of the devices are updated and some aren't. They're just going to have uh, as simple and as most economic approach to, uh, to um, basically managing this and therefore a user in China or a user in Africa or in Russia who's uh, government may not be applying this approach will still benefit from it because these updates should start to be coming downstream. Finally, this is not a novel legal approach. This is well established. Um, and as I said, there is there are volumes and volumes of evidence. It's outlined in the paper that this as an approach works. Um, it does alter behavior and it does solve the problem. The current problem being it's never really been applied to software. Um, there's always, it's software's always been given a pass. It's only ever really applied to physical goods or dumb goods. The principle that we're basing this on is uh, tort and specifically the tort of negligence, which is a private action taken by someone who's suffered harm and is seeking to right that harm. This goes back to the late 1800s. It's principles based. There is a, there's basically a framework in which to assess the, the harm caused and the actions or inactions by the various parties. And it's victim led. And this, so where damage occurs, this can spring up. It doesn't require a, a, a police investigation. It doesn't require a working group form. It's just if harm is, is actually suffered, there's a relatively straightforward um, way of going about and getting it fixed. And that's really the basis of the approach. Principles of like, negligence themselves are quite straightforward. You have a party who has a duty of care to another party. Um, this is this is essentially they have some responsibility. They breach this duty, and then crucially, damage arises. If I own a smart device which has a vulnerability, and other people have have suffered harm, I cannot. Uh, take an action until I myself have suffered harm or someone else has suffered harm at the hands of my device. Um, so it's, it, it, it is damage based. And there's finally um, a point there called legal causation, which is just because the uh, like causation has happened as a matter of fact, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that it happens as a matter of law. Again, there's a good body of case law on this to actually work out what is or what isn't. Um, so it doesn't open the floodgates, so to speak, um, and it 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 uh, it's it's a case where there are safeguards really uh, 
built into this process. How this would look like in detail, firstly, we assume there's an, I, an IoT device, a vulnerability is found, this vulnerability is exploitable, and then at some stage this is exploited, so, uh, so that someone hacks that device and causes damage. Um, during this time, the, the, the uh, producer of the that device doesn't uh, build a patch or fails to send out the patch or make the patch available. And that's really the key of this. They failed to act um, or failed to act within a reasonable amount of time, which is roughly 90 days. Um, in the paper, I've seen arguments for 30, I've seen arguments for 180 and longer. Uh, 90 seemed a reasonable compromise. Um, you can see then that this is not applicable to a zero day exploit. If the company was not aware that there was a threat, um, then they aren't on the hook and can't be sued. If a threat is made or if a threat is found and then in the very short space of time there's a large number of victims and there's not enough time for the company to have built a patch and push it out and uh, uh, tested it, then again they are off the hook. This is really only when the company is aware of it or should have been aware of it and fails to act and then uh, damage arises. And this is expected to be class action based um, so that when there is a... a um, an exploit taking place, the victims will be um, amassed in a number of cases rather than each individual person taking a single case. The outcome of this model is it's to force the manufacturers of software to uh, think about the, 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 the security of their products after they have been shipped and sold. So once a threat becomes found, uh, then they should be patching it. This will lead to design changes. So um, I remember in the writing of this paper, I had a conversation with someone involved in the manufacturer of some smart devices, and they say they write um, the operating system as a fixed block onto the chip. It's not updatable, but it has an, it, it is in, it is um, accessible. Um, parts of it, uh, so, so parts of their own applications, they actually can update, but the underlying OS can't be updated. And that's that was chosen because it was cheap and it was the cheapest way of doing it. And no uh, approach or no thought of cyber security was taken. And that is exactly the type of behavior which has to become a conscious choice by the, the uh, company. If they think the, the actual risk is low, then keep doing what they're doing and pay the price of the occasional lawsuit. If the risk is higher, the lawsuits will be um, kind of the actual lawsuits will be uh, more frequent. And if they're not fixing it as the lawsuits accrue, the courts will come down harder on them. Um, and that should change the behavior. It should also have a clear end of life type outcome for uh, an IoT device. Um, it should be very clear that um, after a certain amount of time, um, it's not going to be covered anymore. The risk might shift back to the consumer or the device may stop having an active internet connection or you can pay for more updates down the line. Again, let the consumer make a choice as to what they want to do and let the company make a choice as to how they want to do it. And then based on their choices, actions or inactions, they'll be liable or they won't. Um, and that's really the approach which we're going for here. There is um, a bit of a role for a regulator. It's not required, but it may make the model more efficient. The first is um, if you have an ISP and they know that there are a large number of people who are running uh, vulnerable um, I IoT products, they should be notified that they're doing so. The aim here is really when they go to purchase a replacement device, um, they will think about it, or if they are a risk averse individual, they may change the device. Others won't care, but it means if their their LUT device is used um, to uh, as part of a botnet uh, and causes damage, they will be on the hook. Individuals and consumers who choose to ignore warnings or choose to fail to apply patches are also on the hook. There's an honest broker role. This is where. Um, if I find a vulnerability, um, how do I go about notifying the company? What if they choose to ignore me? Essentially, I can log 
uh, like my uh, finding with this like, regulator so that in the event it does go to court, it's there and therefore there's a record in actions. The challenge is right now we couldn't roll this out. If I was, if, if, if a uh, state was to um, roll this out in the morning, it wouldn't work. You can't take a case where the damage is what what's called pure economic loss. It's only monetary in value. So if I if I suffer harm at, as uh, as a result of a botnet taking down like my website, I lose trade, I lose money. I cannot sue on that basis. The courts, on the basis of some uh, some views of software going back really to the late eighties, early nineties, have not really found that causation in fact when it comes to bad code is valid causation in law it's something that needs to be in my view looked again it's gone into um, a lot more detail on the paper the products liability framework um, it's a valid defense to say when i ship the product it was fine and this works perfectly well for a physical product because um, it doesn't have people actively trying to compromise it so right now um, that needs to be looked at in the EU it sort of has been there's a couple of new directives coming out uh, but they're really sidestepping this issue um, it is it, it's it's there but it hasn't really changed and then finally there's exclusionary clauses every single shrink wrap piece of software says um, we are not liable you you take it as 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 you find it a buyer beware luckily they've never actually gone to court um it's there to scare off actions it's there to uh, show that if a, a a consumer takes a case against uh, a large iot manufacturer that they actually are going to fight it but they are not valid right now at law no court has ever actually heard a case where um where a consumer uh, has challenged um, a, a shrink wrap exclusionary clause, uh, but it is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. I hope you found the paper interesting. If you have any questions, as I said, please feel free to get in touch or take part in the Q&A directly afterwards. Thank you. Bye-bye.